of today, which will really focus on what are we doing after the IPCC special report on 1.5 degree, and specifically what the EU needs to do to step up for fair, ambitious, and gender responsive climate policy. And we have, uh, we're very happy to have distinguished speakers. Uh, I want to welcome uh, the Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of PT, uh, uh, Honorable Leo Saran, and the Chair of the European Parliament's Committee on Development, uh, Linda McAdam. Thank you. Ambassador, will you want to come here to give your introductory remarks? Thank you and a very good morning. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Cooperative Presidency and my co host, Gulabinaka, uh, and welcome to the first Global Climate Summit at the level of heads of state and government here by the Climate Parliament Forum. And covered by Her Excellency Linda Gete, President of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. May I take this opportunity to congratulate her on the commitment of the Marshall Islands to marshal the global community in accelerating climate action and being the first country to submit the new climate uh, climate targets. Excellencies, this is a virtual summit. A climate vulnerable forum uh, involving uh, you know, innovating and leading by example on low carbon uh, emissions. This summit is also responsible to the recent, in response to the recent IPC report uh, on the agent need to reduce carbon emission targets. In response to this, the Fijian presidency of COP23 strongly feels that collectively. We are not doing enough to achieve the target of reducing carbon emissions to 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre industrial age. In doing so, we are not doing enough to confront the greatest challenge that mankind has ever faced. If anything, science is telling us that we have entered into a frightening new era, and we know that we will face mounting challenges to that environment. Our health, our prosperity, and our very security are at risk. In saying this, we need to use this global platform for nation, uh, national leaders to raise climate ambition, step up, step up their indices, and stay in solidarity with those vulnerable to the growing impacts of climate change and reinforce the impacts of Paris Agreement to limit the global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Excellencies, the goal of the Paris Agreement are, yet, are not yet out of reach, but to achieve them will require alignment of our priorities to an, in an unprecedented global mobilization to deliver such stronger indices that are in line with the target and with the universal commitment to reach net zero emissions by 2050 at the latest. Excellencies, 1.5 degrees limit has a special resonance for climate vulnerable foreign countries. We are made up of 48 of the world's countries most vulnerable to climate change. Our survival depends on willingness of our countries to make transition needed to get us to 1.5 degrees compatible to net zero emission pathway as soon as possible. I'm also pleased that this forum a whole discussion and the outcome will feed into the COP24 Corona dialogue political phase. We will also have the opportunity to jumpstart the process of raising our collective ambition at the Corona dialogue in Karovich. And I urge all parties to come, they are fully prepared to take on decisions, commitments, and hard work necessary to save us from disaster of our own nation. I thank you for your participation and invitation and provide you much feedback and active participation in this process. Thank you and thank you for your
morning, everybody. On behalf of the European Parliament Committee on Development, I'd like to say that this morning's meeting is extremely timely. We've all seen the, the report by the International Panel on Climate Change, and we all should be scared by what we have seen. Because I worked for many years on the European Parliament's um, Environment Committee and worked on our plans to cut emissions inside the European Union, and I've been proud of those plans for 2020 and 2030. But it's very clear that that, that, that is not enough. And as the ambassador said, we need to move towards net zero, and we need to start doing it fast. And the European Union has a particular responsibility at the current time. We know that multilateralism is being challenged at the moment. We know that um, the United States is stepping back from its commit the commitments made in Paris. And that's why it's very important that the European Union steps up now and sets up a firm plan to implement Paris in full to get to um, to get better emission reductions for 2030 and 2040 and to get to the net zero target. And the research shows that this can be done if there is political will. And that's what's so important. As the chair of the development committee, I know that it's, as we're discussing today, often it's, it's those in developing countries, not that they're going to feel the effects of climate change, they're already living now with the effects of climate change. And they're the ones who will feel the full effects um, the earliest. And that's why it's so important that their voice is heard and that the rest of the world starts to listen. The developed countries, the countries emitting most of the emissions, cannot outsource the climate, climate action to other countries. We have to take action ourselves. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing the report that we're going to hear today from the experts. But after we've heard the reports, we need to go away and plan and take action. Because, you know, when we look back at the, I mean, I, yesterday, the United, on the ground floor here, you should go have a look, the United Nations got um, a fantastic stand on the Sustainable Development Road. And they were launched in 2015, and every country on the planet has signed up to those, to those, develop, to those Sustainable Development Goals. And part of those goals is to, is to deliver on Paris, to deliver on climate action. We're, we're three years in, and we're seeing some backsliding in certain areas. So we have a responsibility. And between now and 2030, um, we have to really make progress. Because if we don't act now, we'll have to make deeper cuts later. So it's important we don't lack it, lock in carbon, and we, we take firm political decisions. So I'm looking forward to hearing here the report today and looking forward to listening to all of you and let's us politicians take responsibility and take the necessary decisions to make sure that we move towards the low carbon the net zero carbon society that we need thank you very much and now we're going to hear a message from the president of the european parliament um antonio Tajani. rappresenta uno dei momenti più emozionanti del mio mandato. Il suo messaggio era chiaro, mitigare gli effetti dei cambiamenti climatici e soprattutto una sfida politica. Il Parlamento europeo è stato tra i primi a ratificare gli accordi di Parigi nel 2016 e lavoriamo in Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Yahweh, greetings from the Marshall Islands. Our ancestors referred to our islands as Jole Jananich, or gifts from God. It is a pleasure to share in some way that gift with you today. Welcome also to the first virtual summit of world leaders. Today we will make history together. Only a few weeks ago, the IPCC's special report into 1.5 degrees Celsius was published. We are still coming to terms with its findings. But by any standard, it makes for very sobering reading. 
The special report must serve as a wake-up call and a turning point to all of us. It must serve as a moment in time when true leaders step to the front and lead. That is why, as chair of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, I have convened this historic summit. Today, we come together from all cor corners of the globe, united and committed to find ways to step up ambition and committed to do what needs to be done. The summit is an official Talanoa dialogue event. And over the coming hours, you will hear in the Talanoa spirit of respect and inclusivity from heads of state and government, ministers, and other leaders from around the world on the climate challenges that face us and ideas for how to meet them. Importantly, there will also be an opportunity for all of you watching the summit to actively take part and react through social media. The widest participation is encouraged and is crucial. Importantly, the summit will also result in an official outcome from the CVF member countries that will be presented in the coming hours. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all countries and all people must play their part if we are to overcome the existential threat that we all face from climate change. If there is one thing that is crystal clear from the IPCC special report, it is this. If we do not stay within 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature limit of the Paris Agreement, the consequences will be felt and will be devastating in all countries. Over the course of last year, we have already seen in every region of the globe, in rich countries as well as poor, the consequences of a one degree temperature increase. And although the world's most vulnerable countries and most vulnerable people have done the least to cause climate change, we are those that are being hit hardest and hit first by the worst of its terrible impacts. At the same time, we do not see ourselves as victims. We believe in leading from the front and doing all we can to secure a safe and prosperous future for our people and future generations. As a leader, I feel no higher duty or calling than this. That is why today, the Marshall Islands has officially communicated a new and more ambitious climate target, a new NDC to the UNFCCC. We do this more than a year in advance of the deadline set by the Paris Agreement to show the way. If we can do it, then so can others, and so must others. There is no alternative acceptable response to the IPCC special report. Today, I'm also announcing the launch of the process to develop the Marshall Islands National Adaptation Plan to be completed in 2019. Like other vulnerable people around the world, we are already experiencing more frequent and more severe events to do climate change than ever before. Droughts, inundations, cyclones. And like other vulnerable countries, we will need support to adapt to the inevitable impacts of climate change and achieve full resilience. I will now turn to the United Nations Secretary General to start things off. His steadfast commitment to the cause of ambitious climate action is both appreciated and essential. His convening of world leaders in 2019 will be a critical political moment that must result in an effective response through enhanced ambition by all countries to the IPCC special report. If not us, who? If not now, when? Komoltada. Thank you very much. Much larger efforts than what we are doing now were not made uh, to stabilize the temperature. We could, by the end of the century, be at plus four to six degrees C above the pre industrial value. Next slide. And this would um, bring the, the, the planet to a, a situation 
that uh, is very uh, different from today in terms of inhabitability. And to show that, to illustrate that, I'd like to show you how the planet was 20,000 years ago. Uh, this is um, a planet where North America, the northern part of Europe, are covered by a very thick ice sheet, two to three kilometers of ice sheet. There's so much ice there that the sea level is 120 meters lower than today. Next slide. The difference between that planet of 20, and that climate of 20,000 years ago and the, the climate we have today is only four to five degrees. This is to show how a few degrees, when you talk about the global temperature, really uh, matter. So let's come to the uh, special report. Uh, and this is the cover of the, the report. It's a very solid report. Next slide, please. A uh, very solid report based on uh, 6,000 uh, studies uh, written by about 200 authors, uh, uh, more than a thousand reviewers contributed comments, uh, a large number of comments, 42,000 comments. So the quality of this report is, is very high. Next slide, please. Where are we now? You have seen some elements already. Uh, but the key point, the key additional point here is that past emissions alone, what we have emitted up to now, uh, do not commit the world to more than 1.5 yet. So in, in, in a way, the future is still in our hands. We, have, we don't have, we, we, we didn't uh, emit yet enough greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to bring the temperature above 1.5. So it's, everything is still possible. Next slide, please. <coughs> Now, in terms of uh, impacts, uh, it's very clear uh, that uh, the um, impacts will be lower uh, in many categories, uh, in all categories actually, for extreme weather events, for sea level rise, for the number of people exposed to the risk of rising seas, for the impact on uh, biodiversity and the number of species threatened. Uh, in the uh, food security area, the effect will be significantly smaller for 1.5 compared to 2 degrees as well. Uh, the number of people, next slide, exposed to um, water shortages would be um, lower as well. Uh, what's very important to uh, small islands in particular is that there will be a lower risk to fisheries and, and the livelihoods that depend uh, on them. And then a very large number uh, conclude this section. It's up to several hundred million fewer people, several hundred million fewer people uh, that will be exposed uh, to both climate-related risk and susceptible to poverty by 2050 uh, in a 1.5 degree world compared to a 2 degree world. Next slide. The IPCC has tried to, um, uh, to represent in a very graphic way uh, the uh, increase in risk level uh, when you go from 1 degree above pre-industrial, the present value, to 1.5 or to 2 degrees. And you see that particularly for the first category of risk, uh, risk to unique and threatened systems, uh, we, we would uh, be in the high risk area in 1.5 already. So, a fortiori, for higher value, it would be uh, we should do everything uh, to avoid that situation. Next slide, please. Uh, it's in many areas that uh, the uh, impact will be different than have been compared by the NPCC report. Uh, the uh, World Resource Institute has, has produced this very nice table summarizing the, uh, the differences. And uh, for example, the global population exposed to severe heat at least once every five years would be 14% for the 1.5 degree C world, or 37% of the world population for a 2 degree world. And you can imagine how larger those numbers would be above uh, 2 degrees. Next slide, please. Uh, the impacts on biodiversity as shown here in terms of numbers for those who want the details, but actually the best details that will be found in the report itself on the IPCC website. Next slide, please. Uh, these are details again, but we are not going to look at those uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, detail uh, on the effect on uh, some elements, some key elements in terms of food security. It's high time, next slide, to look at the uh, emission pathways and the um, transitions that will be consistent with 1.5 degree warming. Next slide. And the key message, the two key messages here is one that would limit warming to 1.5 degree, the CO2 emissions need to fall by about, it's almost 50% uh, compared to 2010, and we're in 2018 already, by 2030. So it's a huge reduction 
It's a slightly lower reduction uh, if it was only a two degree target, which by the way is not the Paris Agreement target. The Paris Agreement target is to be well below two degrees, not just under two degrees. And then the second key message is that to limit warming, and this has been uh, evoked already this morning, to limit warming to 1.5, CO2 emissions would need to reach net zero around 2050. Next slide, please. This is shown in this diagram showing uh, that uh, uh, the, the evolution of uh, the emissions uh, according to uh, the range of scenarios allowing uh, stabilization at 1.5 C warming, and you see uh, that the uh, zero line, um, the, the, the zero line is, is crossed around 2050 in, in all those trajectories. How to do this? Next slide. How to do this? Well, clearly, deep emissions would be needed in all sectors using a range of technologies, uh, relying also on behavioral changes. For, the ex for example, the NPCC mentioned the importance of uh, changes in diet and using public transport and that kind of things. Increasing investment in low carbon options. Next slide. Uh, the progress in terms of uh, energy production. Uh, the progress that has been observed in renewables would need to be mirrored in other sectors as well. And we should start to take some CO2 out of the atmosphere, either by afforestation, uh, which is the um, cleanest technique in a sense, or other techniques which would be much more controversial, and the IPCC discusses the trade-offs and the uh, difficulties, the implications for food security and ecosystems, for, for example. Next slide, please. Very clearly also, the national pledges, the uh, existing uh, NDCs, are not enough to limit warming to 1.5 degrees C. Uh, the, the decline in world uh, emissions uh, would uh, be needed substantially before 2030, which is an important element in the uh, uh, political phase after the Paranoa Dialogue now in, in COP24. Uh, and this is, next slide, illustrated by this uh, diagram from the uh, convention showing how far we are still with the present NDCs from the 1.5 and even the 2 degree trajectory. Next slide. The IPCC special report is looking at a range of different uh, pathways leading us, uh, possibly leading us to, uh, um, to, to uh, the 1.5 world. Next slide. And uh, the yellow you saw in this slide was the amount uh, that would be covered by the, the relatively controversial uh, bioenergy uh, bioenergy coupled to CCS technique. Um, this slide, which we're not going to look in detail, um, is, uh, shows the numbers associated to each of those four key trajectories. Next slide, focus on some key numbers, and you see that for the three first uh, main pathways, those who don't overshoot too much the 1.5 degree target, uh, it means significant reduction and improvement in the energy efficiency side. Uh, very big reductions uh, in terms of coal usage and very large increase, huge increases in uh, energy from non-biomass renewables. Uh, the next, uh, the, the last part, um, next slide, the, the last part of the reports, last slide, next, next slide, please, that uh, connects all uh, these efforts uh, to uh, the broader context of eradicating poverty, which is SDG number one, and all the other SDGs uh, uh, which have been adopted the same year as the Paris Agreement, and showing uh, that uh, there are many, many synergies, uh, and at the end of my presentation uh, would have covered that in a little more detail, but I see my time is up now. Um, so you, you'll be able to, uh, can we go to the last slide? Uh, if you, the last one. Last one. Yeah. Well, the previous one. Yes. <laughs> if you go on the first website, you'll be able to uh, find from tomorrow, hopefully, uh, the uh, entire presentation which I showed you, including the slides I've not had the time to show you. Thank you very much. For the Thank you very much, Jean-Pascal. And we are racing against time, so now I'm going to invite uh, our panel uh, to come uh, and uh, speak. So I'm inviting uh, um, MEP Florent uh, Marchelesi uh, from Spain, from the Greens. 
Céline Mias, the EU representative and head of office of Care International. Uh, Sirpa Pitikainen, uh, MEP from the EPP Group and former Minister for Environment in Finland. And then uh, Wendell uh, Trio, uh, the Executive Director of Climate Action Network Europe. So I'm afraid we're going to have to be extremely disciplined uh, so we can keep with time because we have to finish uh, on time. Oh, and the ambassador, sorry, I mean, uh, the, I'm uh, just losing, sorry, trying to, to, to uh, <laughs> I, I forgot the main uh, person on the panel, that's wonderful, good start of the day. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, Mr. Ambassador, um, I will start with you, Fiji has been in a leadership role in the climate change uh, debate through the COP. 23 presidency and in so many other ways. Uh, you're also a very active member of the Climate Vulnerable Forum. So what is your country's expectation towards the EU in the context of this virtual summit of COP24 and beyond? And what do you think would be a fair contribution by the EU? Thank you. Uh, thank you for putting me in the spot. Uh, <laughs> um, Yes, indeed, uh, coming into COP24, yes, uh, the presidency of COP23 coming into COP24, uh, as you will expect that uh, as in the current president, we do have very high expectations going into COP24. And I think uh, at COP24, it will be all about how we respond to the IPCC. Uh, the IPCC report uh, talks and puts everything on the table. Uh, it is just up to the parties as to how we will respond to that. Uh, in terms of the uh, raising of new ambition and NDCs, of course, we have made contributions toward that on the process side of things with our dialogue. Uh, and I hope uh, that can have a, a, a meaningful um, uh, contribution and towards uh, the process. Uh, uh, in terms of the, you know, we are also quite uh, quite anxious to see how the political phase of our dialogue lands uh, in, in, in COP24. So we believe that the that, that dialogue has uh, a, a lot to contribute into the whole process. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it is, uh, as we all know, it is uh, very important that we make uh, deliver on the rule book because. Uh, is uh, we all realize that uh, we are now very much into the implementation phase and to really make progress and the uh, implement the Paris Agreement, the rule book is absolutely essential. Uh, also bearing in mind that uh, the delivery of the rule book is one of the first uh, milestones after the Paris Agreement. Yeah, and we need to deliver uh, on the rule book to ensure that we show up on the Paris if there is any slippages or this is not being achieved, then it may cause doubt as to how committed we are to the implementation timeline of the events. On the action front, um, we see uh, supporting action on uh, mitigation, adaptation, uh, and our loss of damages for, for, uh, uh, for the vulnerable island states. The climate uh, finance is a very crucial uh, matter for us. And uh, we look forward for supporting all aspects of mobile finance uh, for the world. Thank you, and sorry for this awful sound, but that's meant to keep us on time. Now, turning to the European Parliament from the point of view of uh, a, a policymaker in Europe, uh, dear Mr. Marcellesi, the, the, the European Parliament has adopted a resolution that goes way beyond the current EU position on uh, emission reductions. What are the key elements of that resolution and what do you think are the next steps in terms of implementation? And do you think that resolution matches the expectations of the vulnerable climate and fund? Thank you very much. And I think we have to be very clear about that. The IPCC doesn't leave any doubt about that. We have to be we have to act very much faster and we have to, to have to have much more ambition. I think that's quite clear about that. Because for two reasons. One, the consequences that we can uh, leave not only in the southern countries, but for example in my country, Spain, that would be a diesel from here to uh, the A. 
pain of the century if we don't act. And the next climate refugees would be Spanish people, not only people from Africa. Second thing that's about uh, the opportunity that we have, and that's something that I like very much from the IPCC saying that the new jobs in for health, for example, climate action is much more better for economy that do not uh, do anything. And then what we do in the European Parliament? So I think first we have to say that we have some good news from the clean energy package, because I think that's the good way that we are going with the governance, with the renewables, with the energy efficiency, the directives. But that's not enough. That's not enough. Because with this package, we have a 45% reduction of uh, greenhouse gas uh, from, for 2030, but that's not enough. And so that's why the resolution is a good uh, news, because we have at least a 55% um, uh, reduction for uh, 2030, but that's just a resolution. So we expect the European Commission to take uh, act of that and to put it in the long-term strategy that we have at the end of this month, because really we are not on path really to do that. We are not on path because then we have some other uh, things to see in the European Union. First, that's the last uh, file of the clean energy package. That's the electric design that's one of the big and most important files that we have and here we have to say clearly that we don't want to subsidize coal or any quality mm -hmm. assets i think that's one of the main points and uh, in that uh, sense i have to remember that we have to put the name to the capacity mechanism to coal if we don't do that all we have in the resolution would be nothing that, 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 that won't be used uh, won't be used at all and the second thing we have to uh, look uh, beyond the energy policy and the climate policy, because if you want to be very uh, coherent with uh, the 55% reduction in 2030, we have to look, for example, at the trade policies of the European Union, and you have to look at the CAP reform, the common agricultural policy. For example, if you're talking about trade policy, do we think that the CETA as it done or the JETA as it done could allow to uh, down the emissions? I don't think so at all. So if we don't have a trade policy going, was the Paris Agreement, basically exactly the contrary that we said, we are not coherent. And at the same time, we have reform, for example, if we give some more subsidies to the factory farming, for example, the big factory farming that's a product for climate, for health, for people, uh, for the animals, for sure, well, we are not coherent at all. So we have to cross mainstream all the climate and energy policies in the other policies of the European Union. And the gap is a very important one. For example, say, we don't want to subsidy we want to put, we want to cap the factory farming, and we want to reduce meat consumptions. So we have to be very clear in the European Union if we want to achieve to achieve this fifty five percent reductions in twenty thirteen that we have in the resolution. Thank you. That was uh, that was very clear. Now turning to uh, uh, Care International, and Care has been working very closely with uh, women in vulnerable communities in developing countries to build their resilience. In a way, you are at the forefront of helping those most affected. So uh, in your capacity, while you're advocating for those reductions, um, where do you see the role of the EU in supporting countries that are highly affected by climate change? I mean, do you think it's sufficient? Is it sufficiently gender responsive? Is it really reaching the most affected? Thank you very much, and it's an honor to be part of this virtual summit. So I'd like to address two key points, and the first one is EU support for gender equality and climate adaptation. CARE launched a report a few months ago in the context of the G7 called Punching Below Their Weight. And in the report, we found that positively, the EU has actually increased significantly support for climate adaptation funding for vulnerable countries in recent years. So that's really good news. But, and there's always a but, on, um, on the issue of gender equality, there is a lot of room for improvement. A lot more to be done across all climate finance, within the EU, in climate adaptation. Currently, only 1.7% of EU funding for climate adaptation goes for programming that has gender equality as a primary objective. That's really not good enough. We know that women are often the most uh, affected by the impacts of climate change, but also are often at the forefront of mobilizing their communities and addressing the impact of climate change. 
So the really, really the EU can do much better and must better. The second point I'd like to mention is the EU position at COP, for COP24. We believe the EU must be working proactively at COP24 to, uh, to generate um, much more finance for climate adaptation and in vulnerable countries. And actually, we strongly support the, the European Parliament's position for COP24 and certainly hope it can be adopted as an EU position. In particular, uh, we support the demands uh, for, the, for the mobilization of a major amount of new funding for climate adaptation in developing countries. Also, the recognition of the need to progress on loss and damage, which needs more resources. Um, and, and particularly uh, through innovative public finance using the Warsaw International Mechanism. And last but not least, the emphasis in the report on the need for community-based and locally-led programs that really reach the most vulnerable people and communities, leaving no one behind as, as uh, committed in the SDGs. So we believe that's what the EU needs to be doing, also with a focus on women and girls, because that will take us a long way towards, towards uh, reducing um, the global warming to, to 1.5 degrees, but also towards achieving climate justice and gender justice. Thank you. Now turning back to a member of the parliament, uh, uh, dear Mrs. Petikainen, you've been really uh, playing a key role in terms of uh, the role of private finance uh, in terms of addressing climate change. So we know that making finance compatible with 1.5 degrees rec request, uh, requires to shift financial flows, to shift investments. What role do you see uh, uh, in this area for the EU? Um, and um, does the current uh, action plan, uh, is it enough? Does it need to go further to really reach that goal of shifting the trillions? Thank you. No, it doesn't go uh, far enough, but uh, certainly it's a very good start. And let me controversially tell you there's not a lack of the money. So money is not the issue in solving the climate change. It is the question where the money is. Globally, we have, uh, according to estimates, about 30 trillion that is uh, a trillion, is a million, million, investing in coal-dependent and other unsustainable uh, resource, uh, investments. <clears throat> and that is our pension money, it includes for our pension savings. So that is a risk for our pensions and for our future. A climate change like that would be a risk for the uh, investors and companies. We need to change that. And how do you change it? There are uh, four steps. Firstly, create indicators, they do exist, and put it on reporting, just like in accounting, so you can see the CO2 emissions and other major environmental impacts, and that matter, the social and governmental issues, <laughs> in auditing company reports. Make a due diligence uh, uh, report, uh, and reporting liability for investors, to show where they have invested. And uh, yes, you can encourage the green, uh, but uh, if uh, by this due diligence already, it uh, moves the money uh, to that direction out of the old uh, goal, because that would be a short or long term risk in financial and environmental deal. Then the third part is you have to create uh, those benchmarks, and that is the uh, indicators taxonomy how you know what is green and what is uh, CO2 dependent. And this needs to be harmonized. And this is crucial because it is like accounting. If you wouldn't have harmonized the accounting, what could you read out of the company reports? How could you uh, compare which of them are profitable or not? And that's why this harmonization needs to start in the EU but it needs to be global in, uh, in the last line. So uh, these are the steps the Parliament is working right now, benchmarks, steps, and the reporting uh, requirements. What needs to happen ne next is that we go through all the financial regulation 
and put this climate and other environmental and sustainability aspect in there in Basel for capital requirements. In uh, different, in method, in usage, in briefs, whatever you name. There has to be the information, there has to be higher capital requirements if there's climate or other environmental reasons, and there has to be uh, a method uh, that, uh, that is legally binding, that means that if you do not obey, you are sanctioned, like you are sanctioned if you uh, fail to meet the other drivers and requirements. And last but not least, and that was mentioned already, stop subsidizing fossil fuels. You need to put the same indicator level of EU budgeting on our investment banks, on uh, uh, national budget, on your, uh, uh, our semester when we are looking at the national budgets. And that matter, the country could fail and go to bankruptcy if they bankrupt the world with uh, overconsumption and with uh, too much of the use of energy code that is called produced that is co dependent. So use the information, uh, stop uh, uh, perversive incentives in, in legislation and financing, and put that 30 trillion to work for the environment. Thank you, uh, Sylvia. And then la last but not least, um, the point of view again of European civil society. Uh, Wendell, you, uh, your uh, network, the Climate Action uh, Network Europe, represents uh, many organizations all over Europe. Out of the 1.5 degree uh, report, I mean, what is your expectation in terms of changes we need to see in EU's climate policy? And how do you think can the EU contribute to achieving this 1.5 degree goal? Thank you, Celine. Um, thank you also for giving me the opportunity to speak. But I can be relatively short because, in fact, everything has already been said. Um, I think that, first of all, the European Union needs to continue playing an important role in the finalization of the rulebook. I think the Paris rulebook is a founding building block of implementing the long-term objectives of the Paris Agreement, including the, um, the target to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. I think the EU, and in particular the EU member states, need to continue and increase providing climate finance to poor and vulnerable countries to ensure that they can both reduce emissions, adapt to climate change, and repair the damages um, that come from the impacts that are unavoidable already with the current temperature rise, but also with what we're going to see in the coming decades. Thirdly, the EU needs to urgently start the process of revising its 2030 target. It was recognized in Paris that there is a mismatch between the long-term objectives of the Paris Agreement and what countries have individually and voluntarily put on the table as action they would undertake. We're now three years later and there still is no process. We have EU member states that have called for at least 55% reduction. We have the European Parliament that has called for increasing the target to 55%, but we still have no action coming or no debate, no place where this debate takes place and that is urgent. Also in light of the Talanoa dialogue that the Fijian presidency um, has, has started and we and also co-conduct um, in, uh, in Katowice. Um, and finally, the European Commission is coming up with a draft long-term strategy that it will present on Wednesday next week. It's very clear from all the presentations that we've heard that if we want to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, including in a way that prevents as much as possible a temporary overshoot of that target and including limiting as much as possible being dependent on negative emissions, we will need to see not only global emissions go to net zero by 2050, but also the European Union emissions need to go to net zero probably well before 2050, the global ones need to be there. And that's what we're expecting actually from the Commission that they come up with a clear proposal for net zero. And subsequently, we're expecting both the European Parliament, but they already have done so, but also the Member States to endorse that vision and as quickly as possible come with a common proposal from all of the European Union institutions to go to net zero as soon as possible. 
Thank you. I think I believe we have another three minutes. So uh, are there any questions from the audience? I'm also told that there are representatives from the Commission. So if anyone from the Commission wants to say something, otherwise I see uh, uh, a distinguished parliamentarian who wants to speak. Yes? I'll give you the microphone. Thank you very much. My name is Anna Leeds, member of the s and Group. Um, some people have already mentioned, in particular, the, the SDGs, in particular the gender uh, impact on the climate. Um, I know that there has been a um, council conclusion on water and taking women in water more seriously also on the SDG thing. Um, so the question for me is, how do you use yourself the SDGs and how can we broaden the impact of the SDGs uh, on our all communication if we interlink our policy fields on climate and the issues uh, you have mentioned. Who wants to take that question? Yes. Yeah. Gender in, in, in general, just to say that in the resolution that we got in the European Parliament, we had an amendment that I talked about the Greeks that was approved. And saying we are clearly recognizing the gender dimension of uh, the, the climate change issues. I can say that we have 80 percent of the climate refugees are women, are women, and we call the European Union to engender all the climate policies and all the, the, the energy policies. And we really know that that's a reality. That's not only for climate refugees. Uh, that's also, for example, consumption. We know that uh, men consume more meat than women. We know that men could uh, take more of the cars and women more the time of public transport and uh, we all know that so we agree to engender the energy and transition and just i wanted to make a final call taking the opportunity of, of this panel to say that in COP24 i will be we will present uh, two tips on how to engender the energy transition and the climate policies so uh, that will be in the 12th of uh, december in katowice and i'll be uh, very glad to send to you all the conclusion that we have uh, on, uh, on, on that because we on the table a lot of ideas to how to link gender in a climate transition. The same committee made a report about this subject um, some time ago, and there are uh, four points. Firstly, uh, make it transparent and clear that women are those uh, that are going to suffer, like the other vulnerable groups, uh, more from the climate change, be it nutrition, be it economic, be it flooding, be it uh, health impacts, or be it other impacts. But secondly, don't victimize women, put them on power. That means that uh, there's the demand that, for example, half of the negotiators in all of the teams should be women. Uh, half of the decision makers uh, in the local level, energy, uh, energy uh, farming, or that matter, whatever decisions are made, should be women. And there should be a sp uh, special focus on asking and resourcing the local level women in especially in developing countries but other countries to, to make the solution and that refers to the issue of what was just discussed and lastly uh, use gender budgeting that means that look who is benefiting from our budgetary resources uh, EA for example public transportation and uh, building more roads uh, private cars thank you Silva.